Good afternoon, NJMMA colleagues. Uh, my name is Teresa Kessgren. I'm the administrator for the Borough of Fairhaven, and I'm pleased to be moderating today's uh, series, uh, the NJMMA Noon Zoom uh, pro uh, platform, which has been very successful. Um, today, we're looking to speak or uh, talk about garbage um, collection. I think it's very fair to say that in the last 10 years, many municipalities have outsourced uh, garbage collection. Uh, and initially it was uh, very successful uh, from a uh, least cost effective uh, means. Um, since then, um, I think in the last couple of years, many of us have experienced uh, some uh, difficulties when it comes to managing escalating complaints from residents, as well as we're looking, we've seen uh, great increases in the bids when they come in. So I think it's a, we're at a point where some towns are considering whether or not it makes sense to move that service back in house and what are the pros and cons of that. And that's what our panel today is gonna to focus on. Um, we have with us uh, Steve Williams. Steve is uh, the administrator of Chatham Borough. He's held that position for the past five years. Uh, we have uh, Matthew Hall. Uh, he's uh, an experienced administrator with 15 years uh, at federal, state and local level. And he's currently the manager of uh, the borough of Washington. We also have David Siegel from RTS. David's the vice president of policy and municipalities at Recycling Tracking System. He leads RTS's policy and government relations portfolio and spearheads the company's mission to bring sustainable texture and waste reduction and recycling solutions to the cities and towns across the country. I uh, thank you for joining us. I'm now going to turn it over to our panel. Okay, I guess uh, I'll go first, uh, Teresa. Thank you very much. Um, as Teresa said, I'm the administrator in Chatham Borough, and I'd like to thank you for asking me to participate in uh, this noon Zoom. I'm eager to hear all the information from the other presenters on the, this call today. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of valuable information that will be shared in the next hour. I'd like to start off by saying in the interest of full disclosure, the Chatham Borough is currently studying our pay to throw program to decide whether to keep it or not. We recently conducted an informal survey and a large percentage of our residents responded that they did not really care for this program. Our pay to throw program is one of eight pay to throw programs currently in use in New Jersey. There are three communities that use the bag version of pay to throw and five use the sticker version of the pay to throw program. Chatham Borough uses the bag pro program. Chatham Borough started our pay to throw program in 1992. And in the 30 years since starting this program, we've used four different solid waste haulers. The green bags that we use are sold by our, our hauler. And in our case, the fees associated with the purchase of the bags pay the tipping fees at the Morris County MUA transfer station. Initially, you may think this program was implemented to increase recycling, but it was not. It was thought to be a fair way for residents to pay for what they use. If you have a large family, you may go, go through more bags. If you have a single, if you're a single or a senior citizen, you may go through far less bags in a month. The unintended consequences of our program was that recycling increased dramatically and then the bottom fell out of the recycling market. In addition to purchasing the green bags in packages of 10 at three retail stores, two in Chatham Borough and one in Chatham Township, residents are billed a user fee through our solid waste utility, $282 a year for residential and $200 and $38 for commercial. Our commercial businesses do not use green bags. Our green bags are available in two sizes, 15 gallon and 30 gallon. Both, as I said, are sold in packages of 10. 15 gallon bags cost 750 and 30 gallon cost 1440 a roll. Our solid waste program in Chatham is set up so that waste is collected twice weekly from every residence. We have split the town by our railroad tracks. The north side is picked up on Monday and Thursdays. 
the south side is picked up on Tuesdays and Fridays. Our bulk pickup schedule is scheduled the first Thursday and Friday of the month, depending upon whether or not, uh, whether you're on the north or south side of the railroad. Currently, bulk is unfortunately not part of our pay to throw program and residents put out unlimited amounts of bulk waste, so much so that our hauler is leaving town two or three times a day on the first Thursday or Friday to dump the bulk uh, waste. This unlimited bulk waste represented a 38% increase in our new solid waste contract. We're now look at it, looking at implementing a sticker program for the bulk portion because of the amount of bulky items being put out each month. One of the biggest downsides to our pay to throw program is that our hauler is having a difficult time securing our green bags. It takes eight, 10 or 12 weeks for them to receive shipments of bags now because of supply chain and staffing issues at the manufacturer. The hauler is now having to purchase 200 cases of bags at a time. Those involved in implementing this program 30 years ago did not ever contemplate a pandemic or the supply chain issues that we are experiencing now. The supply issues are with the large bags and the hauler has had to change suppliers to a manufacturer here in New Jersey. And we're hopeful that this will alleviate some of our supply issues, but nothing stays the same. This new supplier will not put instructions or twist ties in the packages of bags like the previous supplier did. So it seems like there's always a problem. As for recycling, we use the Morris County MUA for recycling pickup and have a single stream curbside weekly on Fridays townwide pickup, which seems to be working real well. As far as advertising these programs, we use our in-house produced borough calendar in addition to our website to advertise the pay to throw program, the bulk pickup and our recycling program information. And we've found that in the last year that the pay to throw program is, is not without its drawbacks and it may be better to just do away with the program altogether. That's all I have today and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of today's program. Thank you, Teresa. Everybody, I think I'm up. Can you hear me okay? I don't think that is a yes. Um, my name is, uh, thank you so much for having me at uh, the NJMMA um, uh, on, this, uh, on this lunchtime talk. I really appreciate it. My name is David Siegel. Uh, I am the uh, Vice President of Public Policy and Municipalities at uh, Recycle Track Systems, or RTS. Um, just by way of a little bit of background, um, RTS is a, a sustainable sustainability and tech driven uh, service provider. Um, we do we service trash and recycling. Um, we have commercial and municipal accounts. We were actually founded uh, now five or six years ago, um, co-founded by a fourth generation hauler who uh, who grew up in the waste uh, and recycling industry. Um, and of course, saw that once organized crime and, and uh, many of the problems that had existed in previous decades were removed from the industry, at least largely in the 90s, that of course, transparency and tech uh, did not actually improve. And that honestly is the state, I think, of the industry largely today. Um, so RTS was founded to, we created proprietary technology uh, that allows us to track our routes, optimize routes, um, but also track material flows. Um, and we are a certified B Corporation, which for those of you, those of you may know that, that that's a rigorous process that requires us to prove that we don't just have a profit mission, we also have a social mission or environmental mission. Um, we have a fully accredited lead and true, uh, true zero GBCI uh, sustainability team in house. Um, so we're really more of a startup than a, than a, than a waste company, or at least that's, that's how we like to, to run the company. Um, historically, we actually started by servicing commercial accounts. So we have, um, we have uh, thousands, it depends on whether or not you count sort of portfolio accounts as individual sites, but we have either hundreds or thousands of sites. Um, but we decided early on in, in the process that in order to actually move the needle on things like sustainability, we needed to be involved in, uh, in municipalities. And so we started with our, we started bidding and our first municipality was actually Menden Township, New Jersey. 
um, at the beginning of 2020, just before just before COVID hit. Um, we now service um, seven municipalities in New Jersey alone, uh, in addition to Camden County government uh, government properties, uh, Rowan University, of course, a state university, and, and we have hundreds of commercial accounts. Um, I'm speaking today about just uh, I wanted to speak to you today about two things that I think really affect, obviously affect all of the towns and cities in New Jersey, um, um, which is uh, one is a bill that has been introduced in the uh, New Jersey legislature, which would ban uh, subcontracting in um, municipal uh, waste and recycling. Um, so our model, we're an asset light company. We actually don't own the, the trucks. Uh, we partner, we subcontract with uh with locally based haulers uh, and this allows us also to help locally based haulers in a rapidly consolidating industry environment uh stay afloat um but we also require them to abide by our rigorous sustainability and technology standards so for example they have to install our tech in the truck um we monitor to make sure that recyclables are collected properly uh, a big part of that actually and, and the reason that even though we are we, are, we actually are a registered hauler in the state of new jersey um, but we operate also as a broker in this case, and we prefer the broker model. Um, but what makes us different than other companies that are traditional brokers is that we actually own, the, we, we of course legally own the contract and are responsible for everything about it, um, but we also own the service piece. So when you call, when, when your service, when your town or borough um, uh, is serviced by RTS, you're calling an RTS customer service line. And that allows us also to create efficiencies because what we do is we also filter a lot of the calls that don't necessarily need to go to the hauler because we can resolve it. Um, and that in part also keeps us competitive on pricing. Um, so in just the seven towns that we won in, in the year, I guess, year and a half period, uh, we were able to save those townships and boroughs uh, over $5 million over the, over the, the spans of their, the collective spans of their contracts, just those seven towns. Um, I should say that in, in most of those townships or boroughs, we actually do only service trash or recycling. We don't actually service both. So that's still 5 million number still holds. Um, and that 5 million number, it's actually 5.2 million, uh, is also relative to the next highest bidder. Of course, there were sometimes even higher bidders. So I raise all this because there is a bill currently making its way through um, the state Senate and assembly um, it hasn't been voted on yet, uh, but it could be in November or December, which would ban subcontracting. Um, and frankly, I believe, we believe that this bill was, is intended to target our company. I'm not aware of many other companies in the state that are doing this. Um, and this would have a hugely detrimental effect on an industry that I think already requires more competition and innovation. Um, I think the purpose is probably to try to remove competition. Uh, in places that historically have not had it. Um, we have been challenged in court, or we've been legally challenged, I should say, uh, in four of the seven townships and boroughs that we won in New Jersey. We've never lost. You know, the courts have always sided with us. Uh, it's either been tossed out um, or, uh, or we've won uh, because subcontracting, of course, is permitted. Um, but we have been targeted. And I think the next step that, that some of the other players in the industry are taking is to go to Trenton. So I wanted to raise this with you all because I know that you know competition is really important to you. You know, consumer choice is important to you. You want to get better prices. I know some of some of you do get I think really competitive bids, and we work with a lot of the other companies in the in the industry. Uh, we like them. We want to work with them, but there's a little bit of a recalcitrance sometimes. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you. We really appreciate the support. I know from municipal managers, you know, you you guys are on the front lines. You guys are the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, and I work with personally on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm speaking to all seven of them today about the weather. Um, and uh, and you run often run the RFP process, and so this is of concern to you, and of course, to elected officials, other elected officials uh, in your townships and boroughs. The last thing I just wanted to say, and I'll, I'll of course open up for question is, uh, well, I should mention one other thing is that we are very in, you know, in favor of, of, of regulating our industry and making sure that, that you know, there's a level playing field and that we're doing right by all townships and boroughs. So uh, we're not coming to this discussion saying, you know, don't vote on anything. There are plenty of ways in which the industry can be improved, including on the subcontracting front. Um, there are a few things that, that can be passed that would make it, that would require us to do everything that, uh, that all haulers are required. But as of now, we are fully le legally and financially responsible for all of the same uh, things that any hauler would be. Um, so see, Therese, I'll, I'll pause there um, and, uh, and, and move on. But thank you for, thank you for taking time today. Thank you, David. We're gonna hold questions and answers to the end. 
I'm now going to turn it over to Matt Hall. Uh, Matt's going to take us through the process that he's gone through uh, in the borough of Washington, uh, bringing uh, trash collection back in house, which I think uh, many of you uh, are interested in hearing what Matt has to tell us. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you to the uh, NJMMA for uh, having me on for this. Uh, um, I, uh, I sent a uh, PowerPoint along, which everyone should be able to see now. Um, just to, you know, some brief points. I mean, so what I'm going to do is start out, you know, talking about how we arrived at this point in the borough of Washington, and then, you know, go through some quick, quick uh, pros and cons of uh, doing your own solid waste collection. Um, so you can see our trucks. Um, and uh, I actually, I have a video, of, you know, how our trucks operate. And I'll talk a little bit about why we selected the trucks that we did and outfitted them the way that we did. Um, you know, when I got to the borough, um, you know, the borough had been, um, you know, contracting with a private contractor as many municipalities do for the, you know, I would say probably since the 1960s. Um, and for almost the last 20 years, um, had the same vendor. Um, and, you know, uh, we found ourselves in a tough spot because being in Warren County, uh, you know, Warren County, the norm is uh, most municipalities are not involved in garbage collection whatsoever. Um, you know, to individuals simply contract on their own. I actually live uh, not far away in Hunterdon County, and that's what I do. You know, I just hire my own garbage company. My town has uh, township has nothing to do with garbage collection. Um, so, you know, Washington was sort of an outlier in that, you know, garbage collection had always been provided by the municipality, albeit um, you know, through a, um, through a private contractor. Um, but you know, what we saw, so what we saw is a number of things. I mean, number one, you know, the bidding process was, you know, kind of less than competitive. Um, you know, if you went back through the, uh, the bid histories, uh, typically, you know, there would be, you know, one bidder, maybe two bidders, um, and, you know, <clears throat> not to, you know, it, it's nothing that could be proved, but, you know, it, even the times where there were other bidders, um, the bids weren't even close. Um, you know, it was almost like they were, you know, maybe not put out there in good faith, um, you know, by the, uh, by the companies that did not get the award. Uh, but in any event, you know, so we were, we were kind of, you know, um, stuck with one hauler. Um, and kind of what we saw was, you know, the, the level of service was continually going down and the price was continually going up. Um, you know, as a, uh, I'm sure as many, many of you as managers and administrators can attest to, it's a tough spot to be in when you contract garbage collection, uh, because when things do not go right, uh, when, when uh, pickups are missed, when trash is dumped in the road, when there's a complaint uh, about, you know, the behavior of a driver um, on the road or behavior of a laborer, um, you know, in the street. Uh, or, you know, only half the, half the can is being dumped or the cans are being thrown. Um, you know, those, you have no control over that personnel, uh, over those personnel. It's, it's, it's very difficult. And, you know, it becomes a, he said, she said with the, um, you know, with the hauler, um, you know, and, and, and the residents are not sympathetic to it because, you know, their think their thought process is this is included in my taxes. I'm paying for this you should be able to do something about it. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, when you put a contract out to bid, um, you know, you're bound by that contract. Um, you know, when there's times of inclement weather, uh, you know, the hauler can sometimes pull their trucks from the road and, you know, half your town cannot get picked up until the next day or sometimes, you know, the next couple of days, depending on, uh, you know, what, um, what their schedule is like, what other towns they're working in, so on and so forth. So we've always had those issues. Um, so, you know, there, there were a variety of, of um, things tossed around. Uh, you know, some members of council advocated uh, going to just a private, completely private garbage model, uh, like the rest of Warren County, um, you know, but there were other members of council who were against that uh, based upon the fact that, you know, we, we didn't want multiple operate, you know, potentially multiple operators operating in town on the same day. Uh, we're fairly dense, you know, we're kind of a small urban core here in Warren County. We're not, we're not 
rural and spread out. Um, so that was a concern. Uh, and that was, that was, you know, that was kind of quickly shot down, you know, and, and also there were members of council who felt strongly that, you know, um, a municipal government is, is kind of, you know, best positioned to provide uh, a service like, like garbage service. Um, you know, so we also had the option of, of course, going out to bid once again, you know, maybe changing our contract a bit, you know, trying to, you know, improve the terms of the contract. But, you know, we also saw the writing on the wall as far as the increasing costs. Um, so we did some projections and we essentially saw that, you know, at the time, you know, we were spending a little over $600,000 a year, all told for garbage collection. That's uh, the service fee uh, for, uh, you know, one, one garbage pickup a week, uh, one recycling pickup a week, um, one vegetative waste pickup a week seasonally. Um, and we would do two kind of, I would call them free for all bulk days a year, one in the spring, one in the fall, where folks could put out sort of unlimited material um and you know as uh as steven talked about with unintended consequences the unintended consequence there which um you know we were constantly trying to combat is um you know when we'd have these bulk days um all of this stuff would miraculously show up uh that didn't seem to come from within our borders and basically what we figured out was you know again washington being a uh, an island of, uh, you know, municipal, municipally provided garbage pickup in a sea of, uh, you know, with, with the, you know, the industry terms of subscription service. Um, people in Washington would inevitably call up their friends, relatives, whoever in neighboring Washington Township, Mansfield Township, Franklin Township, uh, Lebanon Township, you know, Oxford, uh, not Oxford Township, uh, because they provide their own, but all of these surrounding towns and say, hey, you know, that couch or, you know, that mattress that's been, you know, sitting in your basement, and you've been wanting to get rid of uh, bulk days next week, you know, and, and, and garbage is free in Washington. So, you know, bring it here and I'll get rid of it for you. Um, you know, and, and uh, our hauler would pull up to houses that had, you know, three couches out in front. And, you know, there's no way that all three of those couches came in, came out of that single house. So, you know, the problem of importing trash um, was, was something else that we, uh, you know, we grappled with in terms of cost, you know, and, and it was ever escalating because, you know, the hauler um, would see the amount of material uh, that, you know, would, would, they would take out of town, you know, in terms of tonnage. I mean, I think one bulk day, we did something like 98 tons, um, one bulk day. Um, and, you know, they, they would, you know, increase the price accordingly. And then kind of the last straw was uh, the recycling markets. And, you know, historically, we had not paid tipping fees, um, you know, on recycling. Uh, and, you know, our hauler had you know, basically uh, tried to mid contracts charges tipping fees, we politely, uh, you know, pointed to the fact that the contract was very clear in that regard. Uh, but they basically said, you know, that these are going to be built into the next contract. So we, you know, we knew, um, you know, two years ago, that uh, going into 2021, we were going to have some, some significantly increased garbage costs for a number of reasons. So, you know, we started to do some projections on, you know, what would the new contract be versus, you know, what would it actually be to do it ourselves as far as staffing up, as far as um, the capital expenditures we would need to make uh, in terms of equipment, um, you know, the debt service on that and um, so on, you know, tipping fees, so on and so forth. So essentially what we came up with is that, you know, either way, we were looking at, you know, going from, you know, spending about $660,000 a year uh, on garbage pickup to, you know, spending somewhere in the neighborhood of $740,000 to $760,000 a year, um, whether we did it ourselves or whether we went out to bid. Um, so, you know, at that point, you know, the, the decision of council was pretty, you know, decision for council, I should say, was pretty clear. Um, if we're going to be spending the same amount of money we may as well do it ourselves and have full control over the process start to finish. Um, so immediately, um, you know, my DPW supervisor and I began researching to find towns that do their own trash collection 
Uh, and, you know, I don't know if there's uh, anybody from uh, the borough of Wharton on here, but, you know, we will always be eternally grateful to John Reinhardt and um, uh, the rest of the folks uh, there at um, the borough of Wharton because they welcomed us with open arms uh, to see their operation and told us in no uncertain terms that they wouldn't give up garbage collection for anything, um, you know, be because of, you know, the control that it gave them, uh, the ability to have a larger DPW staff, um, you know, that that's able to do other things around town um, during the, you know, when they're not uh, picking up garbage. And, you know, we saw their operation start to finish. We we're very impressed with it. And we model a lot of what we've done off of their operation. As a matter of fact, if you look at the truck that's uh, sitting in the middle, we purchased two new trucks. Those are Western Stars, uh, newer Western Stars that are um, on either end. And uh, the truck in the middle is an older Western Star that we purchased from uh, the borough of Wharton and uh, refurbished it, you know, which all told came to uh, about half as much as the new trucks. Um, you know, but that'll be the first one that we replace. You know, we're, we're you know, looking to stay on a five to seven year replacement schedule with our trucks. Um, so, um, you know, so that's how we arrived at the decision. Um, so then it came time to actually, you know, design the program uh, and, and see how we were going to do it. So, you know, we, we, you know, poured over, you know, our tonnage numbers, you know, how much, how much tonnage our hauler was picking up a week you know, uh, projections, you know, as far as, you know, what we could expect as far as output, you know, we have about 2,400 households here in the borough um, and looking at different ways to do it. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we decided on very early on is to utilize uh, tippers on the backs of our trucks, which you'll see later on how those work. Um, so we use rear loader trucks, um, which, you know, they're, they're, basically conventional garbage trucks where, you know, you're throwing, you know, or you're able to just throw whatever into the back of the truck, whether it's bag garbage, uh, cans of garbage or bulk items. Uh, but what we decided to do was fit these trucks with uh, mechanical uh, hydraulic tippers, uh, which are actually able, you know, so we, we issue 96 gallon carts, uh, which, you know, are the, the, the big plastic cans, with the hinged lids uh, to every residence in town and, businesses who wish to participate in our trash collection program. Um, and the, the hydraulic tippers do the work, um, you know, which obviously saves, um, you know, in workman's comp claims uh, because no one's, no one's really lifting the carts and, uh, you know, no one's really touching uh, what's in the carts. Uh, you know, our, our personnel are, you know, under, you know, very strict orders to, you know, not have gar not have contact with the garbage uh, when and if at all possible. Um, you know, they're just rolling the cart over to the truck, dumping it, rolling it back to the curb. Um, you know, and that's for garbage and recycle. Each uh, each uh, uh, household or business is issued one 96 gallon black garbage cart and one 96 gallon green recycling cart. Um, so we pick up. Uh, you know, one 96 gallon cart of trash a week. We pick up uh, one 96 gallon cart of recycling a week. And we do single, single stream recycling uh, because quite frankly, uh, to do dual stream uh, out here uh, just doesn't make any sense because we don't have any facilities close enough uh, that would accept, uh, you know, just paper and cardboard or just cans and bottles uh, on a given day. Um, it's much more cost effective and, and uh, time efficient to just go to the nearest um, uh, transfer station, which accepts um, single stream recycling. Uh, you know, the price uh, that we're paying out here is currently about, uh, I want to say it's $90 a ton. You know, it varies, of course, with the markets. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the most, you know, we found that it's the most cost effective solution from us. I mean, if, if you're closer to, Class A recycling facilities, which uh, you know can accept paper and cardboard or um, cans and bottles separately, you know it may make sense to to do a single stream program. But you know it also just adds complexity uh, because then you're alternating days. I mean, one of the things that the residents enjoy is the fact that you know all their recyclable material goes in the same container. 
on the same day. They don't have to remember whether it's a paper cardboard week or cans and bottles week. Um, you know, the carts themselves um, actually, and I should have included a, a, a picture of this. Um, it lends a tremendous uh, sense of order and cleanliness to your town. Um, you know, I, I uh, when I come into town in the morning, I come through, I come down a fairly, you know, major thoroughfare um, in town called Broad Street. And, you know, I always love coming in on a, on a garbage or recycling day because, you know, I see either, you know, all these nice uniform black carts with our logo <clears throat> stamped on the side, uh, lined up um, along the street or, you know, the green recycling carts with our logo stamped on the side, lined up along the street. Everything's uniform. Everything's the same. Um, you know, there's not, uh, you know, 10 or 12 different um, colors and brands of garbage cans in various states of disrepair with, you know, duct tape and spray paint and God knows what else all over them. Um, you know, it, 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 I can't even, I mean, I've gotten so many compliments from people on how much it improves the look of, of the town. Um, you know, when you drive the streets and you see these, these carts lined up, um, you know, and also the lids, uh, the lids are a nice aesthetic feature. Um, you know, the lids are all closed. You're not seeing the, the stuff that's inside. Um, and also, uh, they're also a cost saving feature because, you know, when you're, when you're collecting garbage, especially on a day like this, um, you know, as, as we all know, we pay for garbage by the ton and wet garbage, uh, weighs a lot more than dry garbage. So, um, you know, with the attached lids that aren't going to blow away or get lost, uh, the lids are always down. Um, you know, and the garbage gets dumped and the exposure to rain is minimal and, you know, keeps your loads a lot lighter, uh, which, you know, translates to savings and tipping fees. Um, so um, just running through our program again, it's, it's garbage once a week. Um, the, uh, I, I just saw a, a, a question about um, contamination levels in recycling. Um, so I can address that really quickly. Um, cause that's, that's pretty relevant. Um, so they've been going down is the answer. Uh, when, when we started, uh, they were, they were relatively high, um, you know, and, and, uh, so the surcharge for contamination in our area, I want to say is like 125 a ton. Um, it's very subjective. Um, you know, essentially we go to the transfer station, we dump and they make a visual determination on what percentage of the load is contaminated. So just to make the math easy, let's say it's a 10, um, it's a 10 ton load. Um, they decide that the load is 20% contaminated. Well, they charge us, you know, $90 a ton for the first eight tons. And then they charge us 125 a ton for the, the next two tons. Um, you know, not at all accurate, highly subjective, but you know, it's their bat and their ball. Um, that's what, you know, that's what we have to deal with. So um, obviously it behooves us to, um, you know, really pay attention to what's in the recycling carts. Um, whereas, you know, again, with a private hauler, you're not going to get that attention to detail because, you know, uh, for, for most of our contracts, you know, the, the tipping fees are a pass through cost and, you know, it doesn't make any difference to the hauler, whether, you know, you're getting charged for contaminated loads or not. Um, I am happy to say that through a combination of education from our website, our social media, um, our calendar that we send out, <clears throat> and um, a, a sticker program, which we've developed, um, you know, a, a, I don't want to say a violation, but kind of a notice of violation sticker program, um, we've reduced contamination uh, tremendously. Um, so all of my guys out there, um, they, they have rolls of uh, big orange stickers. Uh, and they all carry Sharpies with them. Um, so if they are picking up uh, recycling and they see uh, recycling in bags, which is, you know, kind of the biggest offense because people, you know, they, I mean, they sell these, you know, recycling bags, um, you know, at the store and people buy them and they put the recyclables in them because it's uh, convenient for them. But unfortunately in the class A recycling facilities and the sort, uh, sorting machinery, the bags wreak havoc, uh, which is why they were, you know, even though it's plastic and it's recyclable, um, you know, that's considered contamination. Uh, pizza boxes is another one. You know, pizza boxes are not recyclable because of the grease, um, you know, and, 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 you know, there's other items which, uh, you know, people term, uh, the term is wishful recycling, 
It's, you know, the types of plastics that aren't actually be able to be handled by a class A facility, like flower pots or kids yard toys or, uh, you know, any number, you know, any number of plastic things uh, besides, you know, plastic drink bottles and things of that nature that people throw in the recycling. Uh, so, you know, if, if my guys come along, you know, I mean, if they, they open the lid and they see this stuff um, where it's readily visible, um, they will take their orange sticker, they'll put it lightly on the, on the lid of the cart, and they'll check a box that says um, improper items in recycle. Um, that, uh, that sticker has um, uh, the phone number to my office on there. And, you know, I, I fielded quite a few phone calls in the beginning. Uh, with folks who are confused as to, you know, why their recycling is being kicked back. A lot of folks think that wood is recyclable too, which is kind of odd to me, but, um, you know, people would put, you know, wooden items in the recycling. Uh, but, you know, after an initial, you know, adjustment and education period, I am proud to say that the contamination levels have gone down quite a bit. I mean, they're not, you know, they're never going to be zero, but, you know, keeping them as low as possible is a priority and you know people people get with the program pretty quickly um you know some of them start out angry you know oh why wasn't my recycling picked up but then you go through and explain explain the bag issue to people which is really the biggest one um they get it and uh and and they comply um so that's you know that that's going very well um so uh, uh vegetative waste uh, which we also do with the same trucks. Uh, we do, um, uh, somebody just asked a question about new number five and number six containers. Um, I, the answer is, I don't know. Um, I would have to ask our transfer station. Uh, our transfer station has not gotten that specific with actual numbers. Um, they, uh, they just give us kind of a visual representation, you know, you know, milk, milk bottles, iced tea bottles, soda cans, you know, that type of thing. So we, we put out a visual flyer to people and we basically say, if you don't, if you don't see it or something that looks like this on the flyer, it's, you know, don't put it in your recycling cart. And it's, unfortunately it's when in doubt, throw it out. Um, anyway, moving on to, uh, to vegetative waste. Uh, we also utilize these trucks to do that. <clears throat> uh, previously, what we would do is our hauler, um, would pick up vegetative waste seasonally from about the end of April to the beginning of December. Um, and, uh, they, you know, they would simply pick up, um, grass clippings, uh, you know, bagged grass clippings, bagged, uh, leaves, uh, and, you know, kind of twigs, you know, not actual brush. Uh, we would come around and trip chip brush, um, twice a year. And, you know, that was always a, a hassle because, you know, people would, you know, uh, build up these gigantic piles over time. Um, so now what we do is we pick up everything, you know, brush, yard waste, leaves, um, every Tuesday uh, from the end of April to the beginning of December. Um, and, you know, that, that actually works really well because it keeps the piles manageable. We do have regulations, you know, about, you know, nothing more than four feet in length, um, you know, everything has to be bundled, no loose piles, uh, or it has to be put in some kind of container. Folks are able to use their, their garbage or recycling containers if they'd like, you know, provided there's nothing else in there besides uh, vegetative waste. Um, <clears throat> you know, or they can use uh, conventional garbage cans, which we'll just dump and leave. Um, and, uh, you know, any, any bundles have to be tied with uh, a natural twine, like a cotton twine. Uh, and bags, you know, if they use them, have to be craft paper bags like the leaf bags you see sold at, at Home Depot. Um, you know, and we, um, that's actually worked really well as far as keeping vegetative waste manageable. We've also opened kind of a, a vegetative waste depot for folks uh, to come to uh, on the weekends. We open it every other weekend on a, you know, every, every other Saturday, basically from 7 a.m. to noon you know, for, for individuals who want to come dump, you know, large amounts of vegetative waste, but we do have to staff that because otherwise, you know, unfortunately people will just abuse it. <clears throat> um, all right. So we've run through garbage, recycling, vegetative waste, bulk waste. Um, 
So bulk waste we do, um, we allow people one item a month um, on the last garbage day of the month and we collect the bulk uh, with the type 10 garbage or the regular kind of weekly household garbage. Um, in order to dispose of a bulk item, uh, folks do have to uh, come to Burrow Hall, they have to get a sticker, uh, it's $10 uh, for an item. Uh, we arrived at that fee because, you know, we figure most bulk items are, you know, about 100 pounds, maybe, you know, it's maybe even less than that, 75, 100 pounds. Um, we have a local landfill here in Warren County, uh, which residents can go to to dispose of bulk trash if they wish. Um, and that's their minimum charge. If you, if you go into the landfill uh, with less than 200 pounds, uh, they're going to charge you $10. So, you know, we felt it was reasonable to charge a resident $10 um, to pick an item, item up curbside. Um, so those, uh, those revenues from the sale of the stickers go into the solid waste utility. Um, and, you know, my opinion on this is, you know, the only way to do this is to implement it as a utility, um, you know, and, and not as funded by property taxes. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, it allows you, you know, if you have a high percentage of uh, rental units in town, as we do, uh, I mean, the, you know, the large garden apartment complexes and, you know, um, large multifamily buildings don't participate. Um, you know, they're, they, they utilize dumpster service, um, you know, but, but um, you know, we have a lot of homes that are cut up into smaller rental units. So instead of, you know, the property taxes on that property, just paying for the, you know, five or six units of trash that may be coming out of that property. Now you're charging, um, you know, you're charging utility fee per unit. Um, to each um, apartment on that property. So you're, you know, you're really getting your fair share out of that property for the amount of trash and recycling and, and vegetative waste that they're producing. The other advantage to um, the properties in your town that don't utilize the garbage collection is you know, now they're not paying for it. So um, most of our businesses, and as I said, our large multifamilies have never used our garbage collection because uh, our hauler only picked up cans, they didn't pick up dumpsters. Um, so, you know, for years, uh, they had been subsidizing, you know, essentially the residential garbage pickup uh, because it was all paid for in property taxes. And, you know, th these are obviously large property tax payers uh, in town. And, you know, they're not, they've never received our garbage pickup. So when we switched to a utility, we took, you know, the funding of garbage out of our general fund and we put it into a separate garbage utility budget, which is for, which is funded by utility fees. Uh, you know, they experienced, I mean, everyone experienced a property tax reduction. Uh, of course, on the, on the residential side, um, you know, residents now have to pay the garbage utility fee, but for businesses um, and, you know, residential complexes that do not, um, you know, do not participate in garbage collection, they just received a tax reduction, which they were very grateful for. Um, so that, you know, that's a, a major benefit of implementing the utility. Um, certainly not without controversy. Um, you know, it was a controversial issue when it was passed. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that it is working very well. Um, and, you know, I, I hear from folks all the time, you know, I mean, gripes about, you know, how garbage, quote unquote, used to be free. Now it's, you know, now it's a separate bill. Uh, you know, even though I try to explain to folks that it never was free. Um, but everyone agrees that the service is superior. Um, you know, everyone loves the service. Everyone loves the containers. And, um, you know, folks really do um, appreciate the service, even though they, they may have some misgivings about how it's paid for. Um, I'm looking at the time here. I should probably move on to the quick pros and cons, and then uh, we'll jump into just showing you how our trucks work. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a, a quick bulleted list here. Um, you know, when you're doing solid waste in-house, you've got greater control over everything. Uh, personnel, routes, time and data collection, method of collection. I mean, it's all up to you, um, you know, and, and, and that can seem like a daunting challenge, but, you know, it also allows you to really tailor um, solid waste pickup to your town and the needs of your residents and, you know, businesses that if they're participating, um, greater ability to deal with inclement weather or severe, severe weather, <clears throat> um, 
you know, my DPW supervisor and I are in constant contact on days like this, um, you know, snow events, and, you know, we can simply make a decision. Uh, all right, do we want to, you know, do garbage collection this day, or do we want to, you know, do we think we're going to plow instead, um, you know, and push garbage collection a day? Um, you know, we utilize, you know, social media and Nixle alerts to let people know. Um, and, you know, it gives us complete control and flexibility. Um, you know, which, you know, if you're using a contracted hauler, you could find your, you know, on a major snowstorm, you could find yourself waiting a week, you know, for, for garbage, uh, garbage collection. Um, so that's something that, you know, we really like to have control over. Um, greater control over disposal costs, um, you know, again, uh, paying close attention to, um, you know, prohibited items in trash. I mean, you know, folks are always trying to dispose of e-waste uh, in the trash, you know, hazardous waste, things of that nature. Um, you know, our guys will tag that as well. Um, educate people because, you know, most of the time it's not malicious. It's just, you know, people just don't realize. Um, so, you know, keeping e-waste, hazardous waste out of the trash, keeping contamination out of the recycling, which, you know, is going to be a big issue for all of us because, um, you know, it, it, with the recycling markets being what they are, um, you know, fighting contamination is always going to be a big issue. Um, you know, this is my, you know, kind of personal thing, the versatility of rear packer trucks. I'm not a believer in the automated side loading trucks. I mean, they, they can work for certain communities, especially if you, if you envision having one or two dedicated employees, uh, you just pick up garbage all day, um, in a side loader. Um, but the beauty of rear packer trucks is they're versatile, uh, you know, we can, you know, we use them to dump our tip, our, our carts with tippers, um, but we can just throw garbage into them if, if we need to. Um, we can use them to pick up bulk, which, you know, with a side loader, you can't, um, you know, and, and um, if we have a major disaster, you know, like uh, the flooding that a lot of towns recently experienced and people are just, you know, forced to pile up items on the curb, you know, rear packer trucks can come in and easily clean that up very quickly. Um, and, you know, also, you, you know, um, we can use them for cleaning up, uh, pro you know, if, if we're called in to, you know, clean up a property that, you know, is going to have a lien placed on it, um, or even demo a small building, uh, we can do that with the trucks rather than um, rent dumpsters, uh, which is, uh, which is a real benefit. Um, greater ability to predict and forecast solid waste disposal costs. I mean, you know, you, you have, you know, you have the numbers at your fingertips at all times. You have, um, you know, uh, the ability to make adjustments on the fly, uh, the way you don't, you know, where, you know, once, once you're locked into a contract, you're locked into a contract. Um, and then fine. I mean, implementation of a solid waste utility isn't necessarily a pro, but you know, it's, it's something that I would recommend, um, and you know, when, when doing this, um, so uh, and we can move on to cons, I guess, um, you know, and, and I can kind of talk about, you know, things to work out for capital intensive, high startup costs. Um, you know, the two new trucks that you see uh, in the picture cost about $230,000 a piece. Uh, the one used truck uh, I purchased for about $60,000, uh, I put about $100,000 worth of work into it, um, you know, in terms of refurbishing the body in the truck itself. Um, you know, we bonded. Um, between, you know, purchasing the trucks, purchasing the carts, which, you know, came to about 350,000 for uh, about 5,000 carts, a little over 5,000 carts, which was, you know, um, one garbage and one recycling cart for each property uh, with, you know, a, a, a decent stock of uh, replacement carts um, if needed. Um, so we ended up bonding for just under a million. Um, you know, and, and of course, built that debt service into the solid waste budget. Um, but, you know, no matter which way to slice it, I mean, you're looking at, um, uh, you know, some high startup costs. Um, so I would say a minimum of two year preparation period before, you know, if you have a contract with a solid waste vendor, um, you know, that's when you need to start looking at this because, uh, you know, the new trucks took about a year to build. Um, and that was, you know, those trucks were ordered in um november of 2019 uh in the in anticipate we ended up getting them 
uh, October 2020, and we had ample time to staff up um, and, and train our guys on them. Uh, I can only imagine what lead times are on trucks now, you know, be, being that, you know, we're now in this post COVID world. Um, implementing a solid waste utility can be controversial because again, your residents, uh, you know, oftentimes believe that garbage is free. Um, you know, education is key. Um, you know, education, information sharing, uh, you know, getting the word out there about how much garbage actually costs your community in the general fund budget, you know, is critical. Um, if I had it to do over again, I would have done more of that. Um, and then finally, once the municipality takes over, the buck truly stops with the administrator or the manager. Um, you know, there are, you know, a fair amount of problems that do rise to my level, um, you know, and I deal with them. But you know, most of them at this point are not so much service complaints, but service requests. Oh, you know, can you, you know, when the guys pick up my trash, they put the cart here, can they put it over there type of thing. And, you know, those can sometimes be a hassle to deal with, but, um, you know, all in all, it's good visibility and good public relations for your town. And it makes folks, you know, it, it really, you know, shows them that you are you know, you're providing a service. And, you know, as I've said, you know, the, the, how, how to pay for the service has been controversial, but I mean, there's just unanimous agreement that the service is superior to what folks were getting before. Um, so I think at this point quickly, we can just, uh, I can show you, if we move to the video, um, I can show you um, how our system works kind of in a nutshell. So one of my guys, Derek, and so he, uh, he hooks the cart there, Tipper does all the work. And another nice thing, if you notice, when the, um, when the cart um, dumps, it's fully in the hopper of the truck. Um, there's, there's essentially no chance that anything is gonna drop out onto the road, which was a constant complaint with the previous hauler. Now, you know, a lot of times it wasn't their fault because people would pile, you know, we were limited to 32 gallon garbage cans and people would just pile bags on top. And, you know, inevitably bags would drop into the street. Now, you know, the, the, the part that was on them is that they wouldn't, you know, stop to pick them up. But yeah, garbage in the street, you know, recycling in the street um, has essentially been eliminated uh, with the use of the tippers. And of course, you know, a, a, you know a tremendous amount of injury avoidance. Um, you know, I th and I think I think I missed the con that, you know, this certainly isn't without risk. I mean, um, you know, you have these guys working in traffic, um, you know, visibility is very important. As you can see, our trucks are extremely visible. Uh, that was deliberate. And, um, you know, the backs of them are lit up like a Christmas tree uh, because we start at 6 a.m. Uh, and, you know, my guys are basically covered head to toe in, in reflective, you know, ANSI compliant gear. Um, so, you know, we do as much as possible to mitigate risk. Um, so I, I, I see we've got about eight minutes left. Yeah, Matt, I want um, to thank you. Uh, before we turn over to Q&A, we have a couple here. Um, I do want to mention to our, our attendees uh, that we have our NJ MMA luncheon on Wednesday, November 17th at the Convention Center in room 308. If you haven't registered for that, you still have time. We also have two very good programs uh, for the conference. Uh, on 1045 to 12 on that Wednesday, we have database decision-making, a best practice. And we also, from 130 to 245, um, uh, focus on the pandemics and how municipalities survive pre, during, and post. So we encourage you to register for the conference and for our luncheon. Uh, and now um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first I, one. I saw one from uh, uh, Jim Burnett about, you know, what do we do with large amounts of bulk trash? I mean, you know, we've, we've run into that issue before and we've simply told folks, you know, one item a month is one item a month. Um, and, uh, you know, if they have extra, you know, we direct that we give them the information on the landfill, um, you know, because look, we, we provide bulk trash um, as a convenience to people, but, you know, they're, they're just, I mean, for reasons of, of time efficiency, I mean, I, I could in theory say to someone, okay, well, every item requires a $10 sticker and we could, we could get that revenue. The problem is, you know, I'm losing so much time per stop. You know, if, if somebody puts out five items and, you know, each item is a team lift, um, you know, we would just never get done with collection. So, you know, the bulk is really just meant for, you know, hey, you buy a new couch, 
and you know you have your old couch kicking around and uh it's um you know we'll dispose of it for you at the end of the month it's it's really not meant for like a house clean out i mean i had a realtor call me up and kind of get angry with me because she was selling a house and she's well how am i supposed to get rid of this stuff and i kind of politely told her well you know it's not my responsibility to you know uh subsidize your your business <laughs> um you know, we, we provide this service as a convenience to residents and, you know, it's just not meant for, you know, an apartment clean out or a house clean out. Um, we have a question from Aaron McGuire under the Q and A, uh, Matt, for you. Can you see that? Um, uh, let's see. Hold on. Oh yeah, I see it now. Uh, how do you deal with the overstuffing of trash carts? Uh, can someone buy more than one container? Um, uh, actually, there, there's a follow up to that. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're pretty strict on, um, you know, we don't pick anything up outside the cart. Um, you know, sometimes people will put bags on top. Sometimes people will put bags on the side. Uh, we simply do not pick them up. Uh, we're pretty clear in our literature about that. I mean, we do feel that, you know, 96 gallons of trash a week is, you know, it's a lot. Uh, and it's been an increase for people. Folks used to be limited to 232 gallon cans a week. So they were putting out 64 a week. Now they have the ability to do 96. And, you know, if you squeeze the air out of the bags, you can fit a tremendous amount of material in one cart. So we found that moat for 90% of people, um, that's, that's adequate. Um, we, you know, businesses or even residents, uh, we have had a couple of residents come to us saying, I just can't fit it in. Um, so we've told them that, you know, they, they may have another container, but we do charge them um, double the utility fee. And the folks who really need it have had no issue with that. Um, they just said, yeah, sure, no problem. Just drop off another container. So that's what we've done. Uh, we've done that for businesses as well. Um, and then as far as upkeep replacement of carts as they wear and tear, uh, the carts are extremely durable. Um, we do have repair parts. Um, and the guys will sometimes make repairs in the field uh, if they see that a lift bar is coming loose or something like that. But other than that, um, you know, there's, they're, you know, the, the body is all one piece. Um, you know, the axles and the wheels, you know, sometimes they need replacement. I mean, you know, and, and you know, we have what we did is we ordered enough stock so that if a resident does come to us and they say, oh, my wheels broken or my, my lid hinge is broken or or, you know, my can cracked, which we haven't had yet. Uh, honestly, we haven't had a, a, an actual failure of a, of a cart body itself. Um, we'll just bring them out a new one and we'll bring the old one back to the yard. And then, you know, when we have time, we'll fix them um, because that's, that's just much more efficient. But, you know, like I said, the guys have gotten pretty good. If they see a loose lift bar or something like that, uh, they keep them in the truck and they will, you know, very quickly swap them out. Um, let's see. And I have a quick question for you, um, and I sure. may, have, may have missed it. The uh, staffing for each of your vehicles, is it a driver and two? Um, tax yep. So I've got, I've got one driver, uh, two throwers for each truck. Um, so the, the drivers are, you know, either have the title of, uh, you know, we're civil service town truck driver or um, operator. And uh, the, the, the throwers are all laborers. Um, and the nice thing about how we do it is uh, we start at six um, and typically they're done with actual collection in town by uh, a little after 10. So what will happen is the three trucks will come back to the DPW shop. Uh, they will drop off the six laborers. Those six laborers will then go off into town doing whatever is needed, you know, filling potholes or mowing or, you know, whatever's going on that day. And only my three drivers uh, go to the transfer station. Um, so they go dump their loads and then they're back uh, before lunch. They have lunch. And then, you know, I have my entire uh, 11 man crew um, working in town after lunch. Okay. Um, we're right on a uh, schedule. I want to thank um, everyone for participating, particularly our uh, panelists here today. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, at our next uh, meeting, which will be down in the League of Municipalities Convention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.